I mean, quite a pull. Have a go of this, eh? Anything to get home. This is, well, this has never been talked about on the show. Just you and me now. <laughs> the camera's all turned off, but our adventure hadn't stopped. We still had a fair bit to go, and a lot happened in that couple of days, mate. To anybody, including me, you'd say that I got a bent chassis. Welcome, folks, to the untold stories of the Kimberley. As we go behind the scenes and delve deeper into one of our yeah, best oh, adventures oh in God. years. <laughs> yes. Yeah, brother. John Oak, mate, finally home. Kimberley episode, done and dusted. How you been? Right. You good? Oh, I'm good, mate. Have a look at the Dirty 30. It's all clean. That took me about <laughs> a couple of days and I needed to get some help as well. It's even had a polish. It's looking fresh. But I'll tell you what, mate, you will not get all that red dirt off. I mean, it's got a few battle scars and everything. It's finally broken in. Hey, listen, we have had some of the biggest, I reckon anyway, response yeah. to this uh, to this three-part Kimberley epic than pretty much anything we've ever done. I mean, this has been absolutely huge, uh, this, this entire trip. It has been, mate. It has been for good reason, too. I mean, that was... Man, it'll go down as one of the most epic trips we've ever done. I mean... Agreed, mate, yeah. It, there was so much stuff that happened. It was, you know, what, 16 or 17 days in total. We were, yeah, you know, yeah, 15 yeah. nights off the grid or something crazy. And I suppose yeah. we showed three episodes of, mm -hmm. um, you know, about an hour each. So we've about three hours worth of 15 days of what actually happened. So I thought it was... Not that much maybe, when you put it like that. When you, when you put it like that, there's not that much. So obviously a lot happened behind the scenes that people probably yeah. didn't get to see. And there's been so many yep. questions about the Kimberley. I think it's time that we maybe talk about that trip and, and, and maybe share some of the exciting stuff that did happen behind the scenes, mate. Well, that's exactly why you and I are sitting down here today, mate. We're going to go through some of the behind the scenes things. I reckon we, we sort of weed out eight to ten things that happened behind the scenes that uh, yep. everyone didn't get to see. We've got a bunch of questions we're going to get through. There's probably a few things I don't need to know as well, mate. We'll see how, we'll see how, how we go with this. <laughs> Folks, if you've been living under a rock for the last few weeks and you don't know what we're talking about with regard to our three-part Kimberley epic, then what I suggest you do, have a like of this, subscribe to it, hit the little bell button, turn on your notifications so you never miss any content for us, and do us a favour too. Leave a comment. All the comments get looked at, and what that does is just help us create more content like this, folks. So get involved, be a part of, uh, of well, it's your show, 4 Drive exactly. 24 7 Exactly, mate. And look, guys, if you're still wondering whether or not you subscribe to this channel, I mean, here's, here's enough of a motivation booster for you because at the moment we're running our biggest ever competition in the history of our channel because we want to give back to you guys. I mean, it was one thing making content like we've just been making up in the Kimberley and KPL mm -hmm. coming up soon, but we also want to make sure that you guys can win a lot of prizes. We, we're really about giving back. And at the moment, we've got our biggest ever competition whereby we're going to be choosing 80 winners with a total prize pool of over $35,000, mate. That makes that a huge yep. comp. So if you're wondering how you get amongst that, you can um, follow a link down below to make it really easy for you. And you need to subscribe to our channel to be part of this competition. And I think today, mate, if you jump on a social media, you'll see we're actually giving away a full set of Dirty Life wheels, like the same ones I'm running on the Dirty 30 ah, here. So, yeah, right. I mean, that's, that's today's prize, you know what I mean? Just for being part of our social media yep. and our, our yep. YouTube channel. So, really easy. Well, like, mate, the cost of entry to, to be part of the team, it's not much, is it? It's, it's ast astronomical, isn't it? Yeah, free. Right, mate, let's start right back at the very beginning. I mean, we'd hardly even left, well, the blacktop ever so slightly. We were about to cross the Pentecost, mate. We got there already, and there it was stuck a huge truck in the middle of the Pentecost, mate. You couldn't get around it, of course. And, of course, you couldn't exactly. leave him there. Exactly right, mate. Exactly right. And it was a bit daunting to see because I'd never seen the Pentecost that deep as well. And that was our first yes. probably indication of what we're in for for this trip because yep. it was so yep. deep. We've got a truck yep. that's, um, you know, it's bogged up to its axles in there and it's not going anywhere in a hurry. So I'm thinking yep. to myself, like, holy heck, what does this mean for us for the rest of the trip? This is the, this That's, is like the, yeah. the main road, not even, <laughs> we're not even on a sidetrack yet. Yeah, and so, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. we tried to go help this guy. So um, I think we sent the 30 in with, um, with, with Tim Timbo. from Mitz. Yeah, yeah, with, yeah, with Timbo's 79. We thought we'll try and pull this this truck. <laughs> we'll see if this works. You'd have to weigh about oh, six, seven tonne at least. It's going to be quite a pull. It gets deeper. Just in front. Yeah, I that. But what the guy failed to tell us was he, he left his brake on. He had no air in the tank, so he couldn't unlock his, his, his brakes. And yep. he actually got water right through the... So he couldn't turn the vehicle on either. So this vehicle was not going anywhere, not with two no. four-wheel drives anyway. So we were, we were mucking around in that river with our vehicles in there for probably a good, what, 15 minutes before he told us that 
crit- critical bit of information. <laughs> it was funny because <laughs> we'd sort of got there and he was extremely excited to see help come along because, of course, it's very early season. There's no tourists up there at this point. So yep. I think he just got a bit overwhelmed with the fact that all these four-wheel drives have turned up and he might just be able to save the day and get out of there. But yep. yeah, he forgotten two crucial bits of information. His brakes, emergency brakes are locked on. The, uh, the, the default position for emergency brakes are on, not off. Uh, and he couldn't, uh, he couldn't take them off. And secondly... The old girl was hydraulic locked, so she wasn't going too far. Yeah, it wasn't, anyway, wasn't going too far. So, so we ended up getting onto the rest of the road crew. They brought it, brought a grader, I think, from about eighty yeah, k's did, up the gig. The grader gig. got bogged as well. The, ba- the grader <laughs> got bogged, and the, this is a proper, <laughs> proper big top end grader. I mean, if it was yep. getting bogged, I mean, we would have had no chance pulling that truck out. Nah. So. No, anyway, that was the start of our trip, mate. That was the start. And we ended up camping that night on the Pentecost. There's a beautiful little set of free camps just up, um, yes. just north of that um, that crossing there. And we camped yep. right on the river there. And um, some of the boys had their first go at trying to catch a barramundi. That's when the big That's old true. barramundi competition came into play. Um, That's true, it did. It did. We did a beers, beers in the shed from there. Or it, beers in the bush from there. Look, I want to I I let some people in on this. This is... Um, this, is, this has never been talked about on the show, but we actually, oh, we all came up with, on the first day, let's do a Barramundi competition. We we're going to actually That's write right. on text on um, Tim 79 Canopy and have a tally. <laughs> There's going to be awards for, I think, the first Barramundi caught on the trip, yes. the biggest, yes. the most. And, the most. Yep. and yeah, that was it. That was it. There was going to be three prizes awarded. Never made the cut. What was that, Graham? Why didn't it make the cut? I, well, I don't know why. I, mean, I, think, I, think, I think the main reason that it didn't make the cut is I just I made the executive decision that I don't think anyone would have been interested, to be fair. So we just decided <laughs> Everyone to... Everyone lost interest like, in that comp real quick, eh? Well, because the, you caught the first, you caught the biggest, and you caught the most. Uh, have a go on that, eh? I know, so, and I was, was, I was stoked yeah. about that. And then, um, yeah, the, the competition fell away. So that's yeah, all good. Really. That's all good. That, we'll get into <laughs> more of the behind-the-scenes fishing stuff a bit later, I think. Now, talking of lucky, mate, I want you to tell off this next story uh, because... You nearly stuffed it for everyone. I just, I'm going yes. to give this one to you, mate. You just tell us what was going through your head. <laughs> okay. Well, let me first just start this story off with when you're in the top end, um, it's very commonplace to be lighting fires out in the bush to do a bit of burn off. And now yeah. the locals yeah. up there will manage that properly with national parks. And a lot, yeah. Aboriginal have been doing this for, for thousands of years, essentially, mm. burning off up there in the right time of year so you don't have a situation where you've got so much dry grass that if one fire sparks, the whole top end goes up in fire. So they burn it off quite strategically. Ronnie said mm-hmm. to us, and we've been doing this on this trip, is lighting fires along the way to try and burn off strategically <laughs> little certain parts of that top end area. It helps clean the track and, and makes little fire breaks as well. So he asked me as well, um, he goes, Sean, when, you, when you're up in this next section, when I, when I leave you, if you wouldn't mind lighting a couple of fires along the way, um, you know, in strategic places, of course, to, to light it off. Now, when you're lighting a fire, it's very, very flammable grass we're talking about here. You light it, and um, by the, the, the time... Yeah, the flames come out of the lighter, um, you've got about a six-foot flame, and you need to be on your way, because then that thing soon turns into hectares and hectares of, 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 of flames. So I was just dawdling down the back of the convoy and I thought, oh, this is a pretty good spot to light a fire. You know, we've been travelling in the one direction for probably about oh, about six or seven days at this stage. We've in, always in been... In a very straight line. In a straight line <laughs> going north, essentially. So I've yep. lit this fire. The wind's perfect. Um, you know, it's going to cut straight across the track. Brilliant. I've lit this fire. And um, as I've lit the fire, I've I I sort, of, sort of said across the... Con- off the two-way radio, I was like, boys, I'm just, uh, just going to light a fire here and... Um, you know, just at the back of the convoy, like I've been doing all day. And um, just as I did that, the boy said, I oh, probably don't because we needed to loop back on that track and actually come back. And I'd, it was too late. I already lit in it. And, and of course, by the, the second the flame comes out the lighter, we're, we're talking about flames that are about, you know, <laughs> about eight foot tall. I'm just going, oh, goodness. And so the track actually That's looped not what you said, back mate. around. <laughs> It, it looped back around, so the fire, I've just lit this fire, and now we're sort of trapped in this massive fire. There's, there's nothing to laugh about. Luckily, the wind wasn't too bad, and um, we were able to get back behind that fire, and uh, yep. yeah, no big damage. But like, imagine burning all the cars down in the convoy, it wouldn't have been. Oh, was, we just would have had to, I think we just would have had to go down. north in a, in, a, in, a, in a rush, I think, and just leave yeah, the track, just, just, just go north. Just have to leave it, we'd have to leave it. But, but it, yeah, it, absolutely that's classic. It. Nearly went bad. I, hadn't, I actually hadn't told Ronnie this story yet, but... <laughs> he'll find it now. extremely funny. He's done it himself, so he'll find it extremely funny, mate. Now, another little behind-the-scenes thing that happened on this trip that I think is worth mentioning because it might explain a few things to you guys in regards to the cooking scene. Now, before we left on this trip, we made a big order at the local butcher. And yep. when I'm saying a big order, enough for like eight blokes for 15 days. 
And so we'll all math. of our mate would, yeah, essentially all our meals were cryovac in, in little portions for every single night. We had it all planned out. I knew what I was going to be cooking for um, each cooking show as well. And basically every, everything was taken care of on paper. Yep. The yep. day that we got all the stuff from the butcher, it just it came in like these big boxes full of cryovac meat. And it's, it's a bit overwhelming. You've got you know, that <laughs> side of meat in your hands in one go. And you've you got all this meat, you chuck it in the fridges. Um, we sort of had a bit of a suspicion. It didn't quite seem right. But anyway, into the fridges. It was really hot up there in Darwin that day, uh, about 40 yep. degrees. Our fridges are trying to get down a temperature. So we just chucked them all in. Anyway, we're on the Carson River track, on the Umbi track. And we have soon realised that, the butcher actually got our order completely wrong. We were missing all sorts of stuff. We had less yep. meat than we'd actually uh, had provisions for, and including a couple of things that I wanted to cook um, for all the boys, <laughs> I didn't actually have any of the, those ingredients. So yep. I, I basically did all my cooking on that trip, just trying to make up on the go. And you probably could tell from some of those recipes, uh, maybe, no. not my, maybe not my best. No. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that to you guys. But um, it worked in the end, but that's yeah. a little bit of behind the scenes, I suppose. It didn't quite quite work out um and i yeah, suppose by, by the what? end of the trip we were cooking two minute noodles and yep. and hunting yep. around people's fridges and literally <laughs> finding trying to find anything we could and yeah all sorts of stuff but uh we I made it work you, mate what one of those cooking scenes will always be etched in my memory mate it was um i, I believe we were doing a stew of some sort it was your one pot meal one, one of the one pot yep. meal wonders and yeah. i have never seen so many bugs in my life oh. now what you folks at home don't get to see is that the camera crew use a huge light with a big shim in front of it to soften the light. So what that yep. looks like to the bugs is the biggest moon in the world. It's the biggest light source I've ever seen. <coughs> and of course, once they've had enough of flapping around there, what do they fall? Yeah, that's straight into the pot, didn't they, mate? We, we were trying to swap them. Um, we even had to turn the lights nah. off. We would try and film a little bit, turn the lights off. Yep. Hopefully the bugs yep. would disappear and then nah. quickly jump back in and have another go. It was, mate, nah. there, was, there was some bugs that were about four kilos in weight zooming past. Like, they, these things were, were huge. All right, what are we gonna do next? Oh, there's a big moth in there. Yeah, get that one out. Get, get him out. What are, Look, what are curry moths taste like? Well, I'll tell you now. <laughs> go on, Luke. I'll eat it. <laughs> Crunchy, chewy. You gotta you got fill with them first. Mate. I want, to, uh, I want to share a little moment that I had uh, where I thought I was going to become the hero of the trip. I thought it's time for me to step up and shine. <laughs> Everyone else has had a crack. <laughs> yeah, it was about time. I'd sort of been sitting in the middle of the convoy just really enjoying a little bit of, a, uh, I was going to say a musical name then, but I won't because uh, people get the wrong idea. Uh, meatloaf, yeah. Uh, anyway, I was enjoying a bit of meatloaf in the car and I thought it's time for me to step up and take the lead, which I did. Yeah. And I don't reckon yeah. I'd been taking the lead for more. You just had your nasty incident, two of memory I just, I, I just put the vehicle on its side so mate I yep. was I was all shook and 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 yeah. I wasn't feeling very confident anymore let's just put it down to that and so I was yeah. pretty keen not to lead anymore I just wanted a just a moment mm -hmm. of following someone else this was your first time leading the convoy yes in was. about correct. about six days yeah. that the camera car correct. had led the convoy for a bit um correct. Tim and the 79 Tim. myself um yep. they were the, probably the three vehicles mainly leading mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it was time for graham to have his first go at leading maybe what yep. five minutes after you started leading graham if, if that's being oh, generous come on five minutes is a that's <laughs> four a minutes very short period of, okay probably close at all minute to be fair yeah mate it all got a bit a bit too much i got uh, absolutely horrendously bogged and tim just went around me and took the lead again <laughs> <laughs> took the lead, took the lead straight uh, off. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I, I put it down to, mate? It's the Tim's a little bit higher up in that vehicle, and I think he can yeah. see over the grass. I can't see over the grass. Oh, that, that's going to be my excuse. Exactly right. But it, you get an appreciation though, how yeah, when you're leading though, when is. when you're yeah. a leading, like you just can't see. You just feel your way, no. and that's why I fell into yeah. that hole. That's why it's probably a stack yeah. of things you guys didn't get to see of us getting bogged. I mean, we didn't want to make a four-hour special of how many times we got bogged, but it was no. it was a common occurrence. Tim actually nearly Very put the 79 common. on its side as well the day yep. before. Um, the same mm. thing, just driving through. You're driving through, and you sort of get a little bit of confidence on a flat sort of bit. There's a bit of grass, and you can't quite see, so you sort of step it up to about 25 k's an hour. You're like, oh, I'm nearly in second gear here. And then all of a sudden, the track just falls away and you're on your side. Yeah. You're like, wow, that just happened. Yep. That's life out the front. Not as easy as it looks. <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> Onward. Trying to find this track at times, and oh, we've said it man. so many times, was, um, yeah. but what actually, I didn't realise what was going on at the time until we got out and spoke to Ronnie, but yep. apparently what we were actually following was the very first HEMA track that was put through. Gee whiz. Probably would have been, I'm going to say decades ago, literally. Yeah. Now, yeah. Ronnie only uses parts of that track. He doesn't use that track.
because it actually goes through a massive valley that's extremely overgrown and hard. he goes around it for the most part and uses yeah. his own. So yeah. heaven knows how many days we added onto the trip by doing that. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know, mate. I know there was at least a couple of days we added on, but it, it's yeah. so confusing when, I guess, when we don't know the land as well as Ronnie, and Ronnie's got his own yes. way. He'll get to a certain point. He knows exactly where he's going. We get yep. to a, a point. We can see there's evidence of a track, but there's also trees that are about, you know, six inches wide yeah. growing through the middle of that track, and you're like, yeah. really? There like were times it, there that, I that, swore that, we weren't doing the right thing, but no, what, what I, else are you going to do? Exactly, and, and he was following it, and then we were even using Google Maps, we had yep. three different sources of GPS on that <laughs> trip and they were all coming to their own in certain times. Like the Hema yep. would go off track, but then the Google Maps would start working. You're like, oh, well, let's just yep. follow the Google Maps one. And everyone's convinced that Google Maps is the right one for, the, for this trip. Yep. And then all of a sudden yep. the Google one just stops. You get back to the Hema, it's, oh, it's 50 metres over to the left drive through the bush again oh yeah there's a track and then you then you'd find another track that was neither and then tim yep. had a little motorbike like garmin gps yeah. and then yep. that seemed to work an absolute Pretty treat well. and yeah yeah so that took us about six days to work out that one that was actually on the money but there were so many times where we even drove on one particular day we i think we did a, a detour down this track which was really yes. really overgrown with chainsaws oh, around horrible. it took us yep. like nearly oh it took us so long and we yep. got 30 k's down to this river and then we noticed there was another track, but it was miles away, but it looked further on the map, but it was actually yep. easier going. So we had to do backtrack after 30 backtrack. k's of blazing our own track, backtrack yep. right around it. Oh man, there was so many times like that where it was just getting, I suppose, quite frustrating. And it was funny when yeah, you spoke to Ronnie yeah. at the end of it and, and told him like, oh, we went through this valley, you know, it was really yeah, overgrown. Nah, right? And he's like, <laughs> he starts laughing at it. He's like, oh, no one's been down there in 10 years, mate. <laughs> like, yeah, don't go that way. You go around that. But you go look, around I think, the whole you know, mountain. <laughs> What we can take away from that, though, that valley to me was almost one of the highlights of the trip because it was like stepping into another world. It was, you know, yeah. there was so much green growth down there and the campsites were beautiful. Untouched. No, yeah. I, I'm, yeah, I'm glad we went in there. But at the time, I remember one of the yep. campsites we got into and I think we were all just a bit, holy heck, how are we going to yeah. get through this? The track's non-existent. But, um, yeah, it added to the adventure in my humble opinion. And another thing that was adding to it, of course, mate, you'll remember this well, we, we were trying to get in touch with Ronnie. We didn't realise he'd lost his sat phone. So we couldn't yeah. actually, we, just thought he, we, we, we thought he wasn't answering, but he'd lost his sat phone. And then finally, phone. I got a message from, um, from his wife saying, no, no, he's all good. But we had to communicate to Ronnie via his wife's landline yeah. using my sat phone. So it all became a bit tricky, but yeah, middle of nowhere, can't find the track, can't get in touch with that guide, running out of supplies. Yeah. Oh, goodness gracious. Well, mate, the track itself, I think we've covered most of that. We were pretty much done and dusted. We'd crossed the last river there. We'd almost said goodbye to everyone. And we just figured... We're going to toddle into Columbaroo, get some fuel. I was going to get an ice cream. Very excited about that. <laughs> yeah, then we're going to head south, about that mate. for the last five days. I had been. I was, I was so excited about ice cream. But, we, well, the whole world had other plans for us, mate. COVID meant that you couldn't get into Columbaroo to get fuel. So that meant that we had to drive an extra 200 kilometres on just the fuel that Ronnie had given us, which was supposed to be the fuel to get us to Columbaroo, mate. Exactly right. And the next fuel stop was uh, Drysdale. They only just opened like two days before. Two days before, um, yep. So they weren't even open to the public really, but they had fuel no. down there. So we weren't ready for that, mate. And <laughs> I, I suppose that the cameras all turned off, but our adventure hadn't stopped. Um, we still no. had, a, had a fair bit to go. And a lot happened in that uh, couple of days, mate. I think the person that was probably fretting, not fretting, but um, uh, concerned the most was Rocket. He was yeah. down to below the E on empty uh, yep. on fuel when we got the call out. He exactly. was stuck on the side of the road. He had, he had, he had just enough fuel to get into Columbaroo with the extra supplies that Ronnie gave him. Now, you've got to keep yep. in mind that he's probably a four-ton 79 series towing a Maverick camper trailer. So he's not exactly yep. the most fuel efficient really getting around. He had hardly any fuel. We're all basically yep. bone dry. Um, actually, yep. Tim Tim had the most fuel out of all of, all of he us. Did. He had he had two 90 litre tanks and I think he had yep. he had a fair bit. Like he was definitely going to make uh, yep. Drysdale. And so we all sort of took off. What's that Columbaroo Road, mate? That's about 250 k's of some of the worst oh, the corrugated. Worst. Oh, and it hadn't man. been graded at all. So there's no, bits where no. the road actually washed away and we had yep. to, you know, almost get into low range to go through some of the causeways. It was slow, <laughs> yeah. tough going. And yep. um, Rocket, he was in a bit of a rush to get home. And he, he took off. He took off early in the morning. And uh, we yep. caught him probably about four hours later on the Climberoo Road, just pulled off to the yep. side. He'd run out of fuel two hours before we saw him. And yep. he was just run out of fuel. He couldn't go anywhere. Um, couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> It was so funny. So what we, well, it wasn't was, for him. It <laughs> wasn't for him. He was a little bit stressed about the whole thing. But what we ended up doing is uh, we, ended up, we ended up taking the fuel plug out of Timbo 79's 
fuel tank, yep. draining some fuel into a big bucket. You'll do anything in a, in a pinch. We're taking 10 litres out of a vehicle. We've got 30 k's before we can get fuel. We reckon Rocket will get in on this much fuel. <laughs> That's right. And we're basically just perfect. giving 10 litres at a time. Like, you got to understand the fuel yep. rations were so low. We had no fuel between we, us. And nah, it was basically an event. Exactly, 10 litres at a time, which is not going to get you very far. You'd fill, you'd fill the vehicle up that runs out of fuel. You'd drive yep. it until it runs out of fuel again. Then you'd get another 10 litres, top it up. And we just kept doing that through the convoy. And so we finally yep. made it into uh, Drysdale Station, mate, to, to, to fuel up. Mate, I would like to hear from the boys right now. They've got a bit to say because, of course, they had a huge journey ahead of them. It wasn't just to Drysdale. They had to get to Darwin for, uh, for Timbo. And, uh, of course, Rocket, he drove that vehicle all the way back to Melbourne as well with um, all sorts of recurring vehicle damages. And I reckon they did a stellar job to get it there. Let's have a bit of a word from the boys, mate, and see what went on. Okay. Let's talk damage report. I'm going to go around. I'm going to show you exactly how much damage I did to this girl. We cross member underneath the transmission when we're trying to cross some of the rivers has been pushed right up and have actually bent the cross member up like that. Uh, had a rear pinion seal leak, which seems to have dried up, which makes me think that I've probably got less than adequate oil in the back at the moment. We've actually had to take one of the shocks out. The shock had actually dismounted, actually the sleeve had actually come out of the top. The turbo is leaking like a sieve externally. Looks like my rear main seal is leaking a little bit. Transmission did great. This one's actually got a big cast aluminium pan on it. She took a couple of hits, big hits, which is why I love the cast pan because the tin one wouldn't have lasted five minutes doing what we were doing, not with all the boulders and everything we were doing. If I come over here, one of the most worrying points <clears throat> is that, see the big gap? That happened when I had a bit of an accident trying to get out. Getting in and out of the car, it accidentally hit me knee on the trailer brake, turned the dial right down. Come around, a little bit quick, yeah, I'll be honest, I was still only doing about 50 k's an hour. Tried to slow down because I had so much weight on the back, the front wooden nose dies, the ABS went off and that, and, and that was it before you knew it, I was in the washout. Now, to anybody, including me, you'd say that I got a bent chassis. We put it up on here today so we can actually have a really good look around and try as we might, we can't feel any bulges in the chassis. It could be stretched, but we, we've looked and we've looked, we've looked, and instead, Greg being our in-house engineer, knew what he was doing, he was running string lines. You actually see, you've got little, little strings here. What we found is that the canopy chassis, which is the main thing, they're actually bent. So I've actually bent or bowed the canopy floor. So I'm somewhat relieved. I thought I'd lost the chassis. The drive shaft's got a big gouge in it now. All the bushes that hold all the springs on and everything are all pretty badly squashed. She's had a hard time. Nine really, really hard years. But you know what? I am so proud of this car and what she's done. There's one thing we're not fixing. All the dents on the cabin as they are now, they will remain. <laughs> Until next time, guys, I'll see you then. G'day guys, I'm really glad you enjoyed the uh, Kimberley adventure. I had a blast. It was an absolute pleasure to be out there with all the guys and everyone was awesome on the whole trip. We did have a lot of car dramas. We lost our diff breathers in the Durac crossing. So we're back here now getting it all squared away. We had a rear diff that was super sketchy by the time we got back to Darwin. About a litre of fresh water coming out of each one. So we've had the front and rear replaced now. Uh, all normal 79 things, we're doing all the wheel bearings and greasing all the swivel hubs, CV joints, just making sure everything's Mickey Mouse. You can see here we've fitted a brand new radiator sump guard. Um, because we're up the front pushing so much, Harry and myself, you can see here, we're just mowing through that trees and the scrub. Uh, that bottom of that radiator caught the hiding. We were very, very lucky not to, uh, not to burst a radiator there. So if you come around the back here, Everything else is pretty schmick. It has copped a fair height in this car. We've got the Evo 2 set up, so the canopy and everything, we've had that back at the workshop. We've gone right through it and we're really, really happy with how that's handled. The new mounting system under the canopy has been unreal. The tray and everything there has held up uh, awesome. We've been really, really impressed with that and it was a pleasure to live out of. It really was. All in all, we're really, really happy with the big 79. It's gone epic. It went so well. We had a great trip. It was an epic adventure, and I really can't wait for you guys to see the Cape York episodes coming up really soon. Mate, so while the boys are battling on in front, you and I are sort of plodding along down the back there together, and, uh, well, let's just say that our journey out was <laughs> extremely eventful as well, mate. 
you know, when you've just done a trip so hard, you, you think you're out of the woods and you think, you think it's smooth sailing from there on, but it wasn't for us. I mean, I started early in the morning. We're driving the 30. Um, Graham, you're just in front of me in the D-Max, and um, I think I jumped on the radio and said, there's a really strange noise. Just pull over, because I didn't want to lose. I was at the end of the convoy at this stage, and I didn't yep. want to lose anyone in the convoy, basically. I didn't want to lose the whole convoy and be by myself stranded. And as I got out, um, I soon learned that, yeah, something wasn't right. Um, I'd actually lost my radius arm bolt. Sorry. The bolt yep. had actually loosened over the, the whole Umbi track and, and just decided on probably the best bit of road it had in 15 days to actually come <laughs> loose and fall out. And so I had no bolt in there. Now, as you know, that radius arm bolt basically Pretty is the, cool. the locator on your diff and your diff could move either yep. way. So not not ideal. And, you, you know, the vehicle would have to go on a tilt tray if we couldn't fix it. So I called yep. you on the two-way, mate. You came back. First thing you said to me was, I think it's only just happened. So yeah. we we walked back about that's right. I don't know, that's right. Couple of car- and do you remember that scrub bull that scared the heck out of Shuey? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's a, that's a whole scrub- other story. But we walked back miles trying to find this this bolt. Trying to find this bolt because gold I, I was, I was pretty clued on. You, you get used to your vehicle, especially spending mm. so much time in it over over a couple of weeks. And I straight away heard this sound that wasn't right, and it felt funny. Yep. So I stopped, which is which is good advice, I suppose. Yeah, it um, really so is. I was thinking that bolt was just. Hopefully, we'll find it because. What's your chances of just carrying a spare radius arm bolt? Next to none. You're not gonna you're not gonna just find one out in the bush. So I'm trying to find my old one. Um, couldn't didn't find it after probably spending about half an hour trying to look for it. So yeah, we needed to come up with a bit of a plan B to get us out of strife. So we opened up the toolboxes, had a look around, a bit of a rummage. I had a couple of bolts, but they're all way too small. Then yeah. I went through and I looked at my socket kit. It might have even been your idea, Graham, and I found an extension, a socket yep. extension, and it was just, it was almost the right thickness. And I just needed to sort of um, basically make it a little bit thicker. So I used some electrical tape um, yep. around that thing, make a bit of a sleeve for it. And then we hit it in with a hammer and it was yep. a nice tight fit. We, we located um, the diff back properly and then put the radius arm t- back back on. We ended up coming past the fence. We found some tire yeah, wire. We used it. Yep. We basically just used electrical Anything tape and, and, and some fencing wire that we've, we'd found and made it work. We lashed it together. When we caught up to Tim and Jesse, they had a look at our handiwork, mate. They were very impressed, I might add. And mate, there was, I'd probably I, driven day, about 5Ks and it's To this fine. day, I reckon you could, have, you could have driven home on that. I could have driven home, no worries. And that yep. was our plan because we had about 200Ks to go before Drysdale. But it's we the next bit of the story. Is yeah, it just it, blows it, it, my mind. It blows my mind too, mate, when you think back, you know, you talk about, you know, being lucky every now and again, mate. And this I was, was telling the boys, I was telling the boys over the radio, I said, look, you know, if this was not so early in the season, your chances of actually finding a land cruiser out in the bush are pretty high because, yeah. you know, midway through the season, you'll see a lot of stranded vehicles, you know, that sort of just get left. They might roll over, they might hit a tree or in an accident or something like that. And you'll just, you'll just see land cruisers or, you know, whatever the most common yeah. vehicle up in that sort of neck of the woods will be. You'll just see them on the side of the road. But I said, look, boys, it's, I think it's pretty unlucky because we're so early. You, you, you won't find another vehicle, especially not another Land Cruiser now because it's so early in the season. Not many people have driven this road, etc., cetera, et cetera. Yep. We turned onto the Clumberoo. I only just finished giving my little spiel about how unlikely it would be to find a vehicle. And Tim said, <laughs> Tim oh, there's a vehicle. Already. There's a vehicle on the side of the road here. You would not read about it. So this is the 30 and it has lost rear radius arm bolt. And the first car we come along, as soon as we turn on the gear, is an upside down 80 series, just presenting a brand new bolt. Perfect bolt, dude. Oh my God. How good is that? I just had to walk <laughs> over there, didn't even have to bend down and pull the radius arm bolt out and bingo, we've got it radius arm bolt. We actually took I, a couple I, of bolts off that thing. I think that was the icing on the cake for me. Not only have we found the exact make and model that we needed after saying we <laughs> never would, but the fact that it was upside down, pointing at us, I didn't, yep. have, I didn't even have to move. I just climbed yep. up onto it with Jesse and the and the rattle gun, and we just took about 50 bolts out of it just to put in your spare kit. It was know, the mate. easiest you know, thing I, in the world. I still carry those spares with me today, yep. mate. And just, I mean, that's 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 a really good dose of luck there. I mean, oh. the, we still laugh about that to this day. Mate, I think, though, the final story that I've been frothing to tell everyone about because oh, one of the greatest experiences I've ever had is what you and I did after right. the trip completely finished, mate. This is This is... This is such a cool part of the trip that, you know, we didn't show on, on the show, no. I suppose. It, no. it goes to show we were out in the bush for a long time, as you guys yep. know. Unlike a lot of people are probably keen to go home and see loved ones and all the rest of it, we, 
when Graham and I do a trip like this out in the bush, it only ignites our passion yeah. just a little bit more. And the whole yeah. time we we're talking about fishing, right? We'd caught, I'd caught a couple of really good fish. And I, yep. I nearly said we caught a bunch of good fish, Graham. That was a mistake. <laughs> oh, I yeah, caught a bunch no, of really no. good fish. Yeah, the Umbulgari <laughs> track and my fishing record aren't that great. But anyway. Yep. Yeah, yeah. and, um, and, and obviously we were talking, Graham and I get excited. In the downtime, while the guys are setting up cameras and stuff, we just talk about, like, oh, wouldn't it be good to come back here and fish this yep. river or fish that river? We we're talking about the yep. Berkeley in particular because that barry you probably saw me drag um, up to camp that morning and I caught a few good fish. We caught mangrove jack that morning and yep. that was probably a three or four hour fishing session. I got up at, you know, before the sun came up, quickly fished to get back ready to film for the day. So, and yep. I had that, you know, I caught a couple of really good fish. We wanted to come back to the Berkeley and really spend some time there and we thought, you know, when this trip is over, why don't we go back to the Berkeley? Yep. And driving probably wasn't an option because it was probably <laughs> well, it's about a seven day journey to get to the Berkeley. Just to get there. And yep. and and you saw you saw how hard that is. Um, yep. So we thought we thought let's just hang around in the top end for a few more days and see if we can convince one of the blokes with a chopper to drop us out on the banks of the Berkeley, mate, and we can actually yep. fish it. We're not prepared at all, mind you. We've got our no, fishing no. gear in place. We've got no That's hiking it. gear. We've got, you know, I've got a rooftop tent. I can't exactly take that on can't a backpack. I mean, no. we, we had no, like, you know, camping gear, like backpacking sort of no. gear, but we just well, basically... Well, the, the, the backstory on that one, of course, is the helicopters that were going to take us out there, if, if they could even do it, were little Robinson 44s, which mean that you can spit the pilot, the guy sitting next to him, and two guys in the back. So yep. three of us all together because we've got to have a pilot. Neither Sean nor I can fly a helicopter. So that leaves <laughs> one seat. So whatever you can put on that seat, you can take yep. with you. Anyway, we've rocked up and we've told these blokes our plan and they knew who we were and what we do and they were frothing. Knew exactly where we wanted to go. They don't usually ever drop people out in the middle of absolutely nowhere in a helicopter. So once we got the, the green light that it could actually be done. Now, mind yep. you folks, this is the day after we've got back into civilization. We've got back into Kununurra. We've had a shower. And Sean and yep. I have turned around and said to each other, let's, let's head go. straight back out there tomorrow morning. So we've, we've gone and done a bit of shopping. And what did we buy? We bought a blow-up we mattress bought, each. We bought a, yeah, each. Not, yeah, we got, <laughs> we got a blow-up mattress each. We bought a pineapple. I don't well, we thought that might be a... thing, that, that pineapple. We, little, yeah. we, we had all this space that we couldn't use. And we, we got this pineapple we took out there with us. Which is quite, and we yeah, ended up giving fruit. the pineapple to the chopper pilot on the way back. We didn't even eat it. <laughs> we didn't end up eating it. We didn't take much food. We took no. um, a couple of things of noodles just in case we didn't catch just any fish. Case. Our plan was to live off the land. We, some we took some alfoil, some lemons, a couple of yeah, onions, onions. Um, yep. a couple of sweet yep. potatoes. You get That's the it. idea. It was pretty slim pickings and pretty we slim. had to rely on ourselves to catch fish. We, yep. we had three days up our sleeve and just got yep. this chopper pilot to drop us on the rocks up on the Berkeley, mate. Oh, man. And when that, when, that, when that chopper left and it was just that silence of the Kimberley, you know, you're completely remote with nothing more than a pineapple and a couple of blow-up yep. mattresses. <laughs> it, was, um, it was a heck of a feeling, but he, he dropped us right where the salt meets the fresh. And that's yep. uh, that time of year, that just makes for unbelievable fishing. And we spent three days living on these rocks. We brought four beers and yep. um, kept those in the <laughs> creek. And at night, we'd walk down in the darkness and go yep. down and grab one of those, and which were lukewarm beers at Kimberley Cold. We'd have, to, we'd have to go through the water and just pick our way between the freshwater crocs to get to our Kimberley Cold beers. And we'd sit in a rock in the dark <laughs> yeah, and that's right, have a, that's have a right. lukewarm beer. And we'd, I think we're the two happiest blokes in the world at that point. We're catching good barra. And it's just the most beautiful spot, the, uh, the top, the headwaters. Well, it's just you and me now. <laughs> what we got? That's our little camp. It'll look better later. But for now, let's go fishing. Sean and I wasted absolutely zero time wetting a line, and it didn't take long before the results started to speak for themselves. I managed to finally nail my first barra over a metre. It's a donkey, man. That's a big one. Oh. Holy heck, how many casts have we done? A lot of casts. But you only need one, eh? That's exactly it. Okay. There you go. <laughs> yeah, brother. Oh, my goodness. Two for two, brother. <laughs> woo, woo. Sean, I got some high 80s and some stonkers <laughs> right up in the high 90s. Yes. Yeah, brother. That's so sick. All right, here we go over at Barra Camp. I've got to say, dinner, mate. No guesses. Let me go that. That is looking good. We've got these little. We've got a couple of barra fillings. Let's whip the fillings off. We've still got the scales and the skin on underneath. Definitely eat them. And um, that, that, when that's cooked, that'll just fall straight off. I'm gonna put half an onion in the fire, mate. Did it? Oh yeah, nice. Fire. Fire. Mm -hmm. 
We've got our beds over there somewhere. There's a little, little mattress. There's mine. Yeah, and over there there's another one. <laughs> there's one over there. Yeah, out in the bush. Mate, it's as good as it gets if you ask me. All right, let's cook these bad boys up. Done. Folks, those three days were the highlight of my year so far, and it just goes to show, don't wait, just do it. Right, I, I thought it's time that we um, go through some of the questions that you guys have about our Kimberley trip, because we obviously got a stack of questions um, asking us all sorts of things. Why do you do this? What about this? How do I do this? <laughs> this will also give you guys a bit of an insight as well from behind the scenes. So, Graham, the first one, yep. mate, this one here is from Ashton. Um, how much fuel did you actually bring? That's a good question. Mate, I think the, the, the sum total, there, well, the answer to that is not enough. <laughs> not, not, a, not, enough. A, not enough. I suppose if there was a, if there was a proper track there, that the fuel provisions yep. we had would have been absolutely perfect. Um, oh, yeah, it was a lot sure. harder than we yeah. probably thought. I think every vehicle yep. had about 200 litres. Some had a little bit more, some had a little bit less. Little um, bit like less. The, yeah, like the yeah, D-Max, yeah. for instance, had a little bit less because it's more economical yep. than, say, yep. you know, the big yep. 79s and stuff. Um, yep. But, yeah, typically about but the 200 good, litres. That's a good That's a good ballpark. I think I had about a, a, the 160 mark, I think I had, 160. roughly speaking, 160 to 180. Yeah, I had a 190 litre tank in this. I had two jerrys in the back. I think I ended up giving a jerry to you, Graham, and one to the camera yep. crew. And I ended up getting a jerry somewhere, so I got a jerry off someone else later yeah, on the yeah. track. Anyway, we, I guess when we all started running run out of fuel, it became, you know, whoever <laughs> ran out of fuel got, got the next bit of fuel. So here's another one from Matt. What would you have done if you didn't make it? Pretty good question too, really. We Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great it, question. Like it obviously came up between over. us a fair bit on that track. Yeah, it did, it did. Especially sort of at that halfway mark where we thought, Struth, this mm. is taking probably three times longer than we expected it to take. Yeah. Um, and what's ahead of us? We knew it was still you know, really gnarly ahead of us, what's what, what's going on. So I think at one point, mate, we, we even considered at one point yep. turning back because we knew even though we're roughly halfway, the track was now in place. So getting exactly. back would be a far easier proposition. Yeah. We thought, thought about that, but you don't, you don't get anything from quitting. So we exactly, to exactly going. right. We weren't there to quit. And I think I think if, look, if push came to shove and, and we ended up running out of fuel and tyres properly, we might have had to leave yep. vehicles. And that's, that's look, that's... Yeah. That's a that's a very negative situation when you have to leave a vehicle. It's only been one time in the history of trips we've yes. done, Graham. We've had to leave a camera you car once, but that would have been our plan, I suppose. When it all started going really pear shaped, we'd have to just leave yep. vehicles. Um, so what? Get, get all the good parts and all the good bits, and 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 the vehicles that are the strongest keep going, and you'd have to come back for the other ones. It didn't come down to that, mate. We made it. Didn't out the end. it? Didn't it? Didn't we? Ca we got out. This one here is from Hanko, mate. Um, what's the range up ever in four-wheel drive after the 35s are fitted to the rear of the four-wheel drive? Or did it just do yeah. everything in two-wheel drive? Obviously, obviously it was in two-wheel drive for, I would say, 95% of the time that it had those 35s on the rear. But yep. some sections where we knew it was just a short pinch and we needed everything to get through it, yeah, yep. Jesse would slip it back into four-wheel drive. And, uh, yeah, he was, a, he was a wacky racer, mate. He was a he hot was. vehicle. <laughs> he was, and he, the bloke can steer a four-wheel drive. Uh, no doubt about that. And I've got to say as well... Um, when you're the first, second, or third vehicles, you're sort of making the track. Um, yeah. When, when when you get a couple of vehicles on the track, it looks like the road has been there for 25 years. It actually gets a oh, lot easier. So obviously, hit him yeah. down to the back of the convoy, um, put less strain on the vehicle too. This one here is from Jacob. How many tire plugs uh, total did you use all together? Wow. Well, I don't Mate, know if I can count that um, high. No, look, it's, and I think if we give the number now, people are going to say we, we're, we're making this up and it's not true. But I think at one point on one side of the vehicle, yep. uh, front and rear, I think between the two, I think we had between 40 and 50 plugs in yeah, two tyres. Yeah, easy. Um, I get, remember that. That, me, was, that, that was a bit of a trip record for us having 50 plugs on one side of a vehicle. Yep. I think in one tyre you had over 30 <laughs> plugs. I think you That's had right. three or four punches in one tyre with that were plugged up at yeah. various stages. Yeah, um, and I and just had to keep stopping it, plug it fall out, or you mm. know, I just keep, had to keep stopping and replugging it, and it, it became a bit of a you know just a daily thing for me just to get out of the car and stretch my legs, plug the tyre, pump it back up again, keep going. Here's another one, mate. Uh, G Benson, eighty-eight. If you were doing it a second time around and had the opportunity, oh, yes. what would you take or do differently? I'd probably take some inner tubes next time around. Um, yeah, good call. There was a bit of a learning curve for me. Um, you know, even with, you know, the best make of tyres you might have, uh, we all run very good tyres on all different vehicles. Yep. Um, when yep. you're basically forging a track and going through virgin bushland, you've got to do tyres. There's no two ways about it. So maybe some inner tubes would have been the next step. Aside from that, I think we came into it extremely well prepared. What we exactly. didn't expect was the track being in such poor condition after two wet seasons of yeah. not being driven and no one could have really prepared us any more for that. You know, yeah. we had everything else we needed. I, I think to, for me, it would have been a little luxury items. I mean, like I say, I was having 
some bizarre instant rice for breakfast toward the end of the trip because it was all I could find in my vehicle. I probably would have taken a little bit more in the way of foodstuffs maybe. Yeah. I had no snacks left, you know. I was starting to get a bit, you know, for a bloke of my size, I don't eat that much, <laughs> yeah, but I, yeah, I was that's... starting to get a bit peckish towards the end. But I, I think we were pretty well prepared, all things we, considered. We were well prepared, mate. One thing I would do again is make sure I've got solar on my vehicle because oh, we're, yeah, we're yeah. running the vehicles, even though we're running them eight hours a day or something like that, there's a lot of times where the vehicles were turned off where you, you're trying yeah. to get one vehicle through an obstacle and your vehicle's yeah. actually not getting much use. And it, because you're doing in first gear, mm. just idling along all day, the alternator's not getting enough charge to those batteries. So even though you've got a U-Butte 12 volt system, if you're not using that vehicle and the alternator's not charging those batteries, you're going to have bugger all power left. So I'd definitely fit a solar panel next time I do a remote trip like that. Um, and to give you an idea of... I guess how prepared we were. I think every single vehicle, especially if it was an automatic vehicle, had a new starter motor. We had spare starter motors. We had um, alternators. We had so many spare parts that were completely self-sufficient. Another question, mate, from Adam Fisher. Did the boys have too many beers on the fishing for food cookup? Um, what? Too Why would how you say that? Too many. Yeah, he's like, well, that's exactly right. You're not my real mum. Is there like, a number? Just, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think there's a number, but you're not like, to be honest, I'd... I'd I don't think as many as you think because yeah, you got to imagine this is near the end of the trip. Um, the heat, the, the build up, it's all the seasons are going on yep. in the top end. I mean, it was affecting yeah. us too. We're a little bit tropo at this stage. So uh, yeah. <laughs> you don't need yeah, many no, beers, I, I suppose. You don't need many beers. I, I, look, at what we had, we had had a couple of beers. Yes, the answer yeah. is yes, but I don't think as many as you think. No. Here's another question from Not Legit Do you guys edit while out in the bush or what? He's curious. Ooh, that's a good question. I mean, the boys do do a fair bit of stuff out in the bush, but it's not so much yeah. editing. They kind of do a lot of backing up out there because, of course, if we lose any footage, yeah. well, we're stuffed. We've got to do so it all do, again. Uh, Actually, that'd be a cool thing. Yeah, we've got to turn around and do it all again. <laughs> so they back everything up. Now, to put that into perspective, they're talking two drones, three main cameras, all the in-car stuff. To yeah. back that up every night is it's crazy. They work, yeah. They're working average of 14 hours a day, the camera crew. Um, and to give you a bit of a stat, those that sort of know what I'm going to talk about here, they ended up with five terabytes of raw data at the end of the trip, which five is terabytes. If you, wow, that's that's like a yeah. I can't even I can't even that's give you a, an example of what that's like. It's a lot. It's a heck of a lot. It's a bit of footage, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the boys work extraordinarily hard out there, and uh, hats off to them. What on earth? Hydrolite? They don't work that hard. And then it takes a long time when they get back to edit it because I, I suppose you know this is. We've got so many, so many cameras, it's quite high production values. Um, the boys yep. probably spend another three weeks on every single show to edit it before it Easy. comes out. So, you know, there's, yep. there's probably another 10 weeks worth of work when they get back to the office and, and consolidate all that footage and put it together in a format that you can see on YouTube. So, yeah, it's quite a process. Yep. It's quite a process. It's a heck of a process, mate. A heck of a process. This one from Deck Groves 19 How do we get in contact with Ronnie or a guide to go oh, and yeah. actually do the Umbi track? And this is the thing, I mean, yep. you, when you go and do the Umbi track, you'll do it with Ronnie. Or, or one, of the, one of Ronnie's mates up there, and um, you don't need he a heavily modified going. vehicle. Exactly right. He knows where he's going, and the track's already been blazed through from people like yeah. us, and yep. it'll be a lot easier going, so you can spend more time enjoying the scenery, the fishing spots, yep. the swimming holes, all that sort of stuff, and less time yeah. you know, under a car fixing a, a busted tyre. So the best exactly, way, mate, exactly. the best way to get in touch with Ronnie is um, straight onto his uh, website, give him a call. We actually spoke to a group of people that were just about to go on a tour when we'd all finished up, they were so excited, they were asking us what to expect. Oh, they were, they were frothing. I've subsequently talked to one of them. That bloke, uh, there was a bloke up there that did a bit of a podcast while he was up there. I've yep. subsequently spoken to him and he had the time of his life and he yeah. rated that track as one of the greatest experiences he's ever done. So, folks, get in touch with Ronnie. Put yep. it on your bucket list. You know, you might save up a bit between now and then. It's a long way for everyone on the East Coast just to get to the start of that track. Exactly. But trust me, folks, it is, it is probably the greatest four-wheel drive track in Australia. Yeah, exactly right, mate. Well, that sort of... Brings us to the end of um, the behind the scenes on the Kimberley trip. I hope you guys have enjoyed this one. I mean, it was such an epic trip in so many ways. I'm sick of saying it. You guys know how epic it was. You guys loved it. I've never seen so much passion from our audience. Um, yeah. Even, even just though you guys were so excited for the next episode to drop. And yep. um, we we're trying to get them out as quick as we possibly could. So I hope you've enjoyed yep. the whole experience, mate. Like for me, trip of a lifetime, mate. And, don't yeah. think that's it for us, though. We've got some really cool things coming up, mate. We've got our Cape York yeah. trip coming up, which... Um, which was probably one of the best Cape trips I've ever done. I know, I know, I know. It just so keeps getting better this year in terms to. of content. Um, we took the old yep. 47 Series farm truck up, <laughs> Graham and myself. So we're talking about a stock standard old 
you know, 1980 Toyota Land Cruiser. And, um, yep. mate, I've actually, you can't see it on camera, but I've just emptied the tray out with all, everything's oh. covered in red dust. I mean, there's just oh. red dust and diesel through everything. And, yeah, you know, we're, 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 still trying to, we're still trying to wipe the smile off my face for that one, mate. So you guys can look forward to yeah, that. She was a um, yep. I, I suppose I wouldn't mind putting it out to you guys, though. Where would you like to see us go next? You know, you guys would probably like to see us maybe hit your t hometown or um, some of your local tracks or something like that. Let us know in the comments below. Yeah, let us know. Where you'd like to see us well, go look. because there's a good chance we'll turn up. There's, there's no doubt about that. We froth on this lifestyle. and um, Absolutely you know. do. And look, guys, if you've got any questions about the Kimberley that we didn't answer, please stick them in the comments down below and use the one, the comment that's pinned to the top. Stick your questions in there and we'll, uh, we'll jump on and do our best to answer them. Yep. For now, though, mate... I have got to go. I've got my rooftop tent in uh, on the old GU out there. It is wet from a weekend of camping. I need yep. to go and air that out, mate. Do a bit of washing myself. Well, Get mate, ready for the next weekend. Well, for me, I'm going to go lie under the dirty 30, pretend I'm working and have a quiet beer so the missus doesn't find me, mate. <laughs> but uh, until then, <laughs> I'll like uh, see Cheers, you around. Cheers, guys. Cheers, guys. Look, we hope you've enjoyed our Kimberley series as much as we have enjoyed making it. But before we go, we've got one last story to share. After days in the heat and the dust of the Kimberley, it's fair to say that the entire crew went just a little bit troppo. Enjoy this, folks. Yeah, Graham, you got a copy there, mate. Woo! Have I got a copy? I sure do, mate. I sure do. Losing my mind a little back here. Oh, you and me both, mate. It's just that time of day you've been pushing through buffalo grass and bamboo grass about 50 times. F*** hell out. <laughs> G'day, Sean. Got a copy, mate? Good morning! It's been three days driving in first gear, yeah. low range. <laughs> Going a little bit crazy. Day 5,632. We're driving 5Ks an hour. This week on YouTube, <laughs> me and the boys take a bath together. There you go. <laughs> bye bye, Lady Matello. Big day, boys. Where's the track? I've been in the bush too long. I'm starting to think weird thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Can I get it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tropics, the heat. That'll send a man sideways. <laughs> we got you, Harry. <laughs> Tell your mother I saved your life. <laughs> There's no aphrodisiac like my 79 engine. It goes. Ooh, uh, my <laughs> <laughs> The tires are popping. The tanks are leaking. The tips are popped. Everything is wrecked. Matt kept fired. We're going on a trip. We're behind schedule. We've got so far to go. We don't know if we're going to make it to Long Beach. You know it. Oh man, that's kids right there. It's gonna be a long, long time Until the touchdown brings me round I get to find you Another man that think I am at home No, 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 no I'm a lucky man Lucky man